Today is all about feeds and speeds for my TAG CNC mill. I'm applying some things I learned from the NYC CNC videos on feeds and speeds. Welcome to another episode. Since this is my first time using Fusion 360 for creating a mold, I decided to do some tests to try to dial in the feeds and the speeds. I created this test part and this just has a hole which is going to be where the quarter inch dowel pin will go. So I want to try some different strategies for milling this hole. In the past I would have done it entirely with a quarter inch cutter making uh, cut passes, multiple passes, not very deep, I think uh, on the order of 5% of the tool diameter. So with an H of an eighth of an inch, that means about uh, five thousandths of an inch per pass. That means I was only using the tip of the cutter. So I want to try something that uh, John Saunders over at NYC CNC suggests, which is to use more of the length of the cutter. First thing I'll do is I'll create the setup. And I'll go ahead, I don't want to... Um, for this purpose, for the purposes here, I don't need this to be larger than the part. So I'll just say no additional stock. And then for setup, I want to set the axis to be right there. So I'll say select Z axis, click right there, and that actually is perfect. So I'll keep that for the setup. Uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, manually move the mill to where I want to try it out and then set that as the X and Y. Uh, zero points and then try to mill it there and do that multiple times until I get it right. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try drilling first. Now I originally tried this with a uh, 964 I think it was drill. I, I don't re or I don't remember the 916 something like that. Uh, and it was too long for my mill. I didn't have enough Z travel. So what I'm doing instead Actually, I can show you here. Originally, I was using a uh, uh, 3 sixteenths. Now I'm going to switch to a 9 sixty-fourths, which is a shorter drill. Okay. For geometry, I'm going to go ahead and select the hole. And then I'll change the bottom to go all the way through. And the reason I'm going to go all the way through here, uh, let's see, bottom is model bottom is um, because I'm going to try dowel pins in here and if I need to I can uh, you know with a hole through the back I can always uh, tap out the the dowel pin and try it in a different hole. Uh, I also wanted to go a little bit past the, the the bottom so I'll say you know 0.1 inches below and also make sure that the tip goes all the way through. So that means uh, I probably don't even need it to be that far. 0.05 inches should be plenty. And then the final thing is I want to set this instead of wrap it out with deep drilling. I want to do deep drilling so that it goes in and out a few times. And I'll just accept all the defaults, defaults for this. Including here, I'll accept the default is about uh, you know, 8100 RPMs. Actually, let me check to see what my machine is. And it's either 6700 or 10,000. So I'll change this to 6700. All right, go ahead and do that. And as you can see, it goes through the bottom. Next thing I'm going to work on is the adaptive clearing to clear out most of the material outside of where the drill was. So I'll select adaptive clearing. I'll choose my 1 8 inch end mill. And then I'm going to change the feed per tooth to be a little bit less because uh, I don't want to push the tool too hard. And I'm going to, on uh, geometry, I'll do rest machining and then I'll say from previous operations. And what you'll see is that means that will allow the, the cutter to plunge all the way down before it circles around. Uh, so that way I don't have to worry about telling it to plunge instead of spiraling because it'll know that it can easily plunge the 
cutter it down because there won't be any material there. Okay, then I'll go to passes. And for passes, uh, I'm going to change the optimal load because this is a little bit too much. So I'm going to drop it down to 25% instead of 40%. I'm also going to change the roughing step down. And I'll show you why. So if I just click OK now and let it calculate, you, what you're going to see is it's only going to, to mill at one level. And I want it to mill at several levels to reduce the load on the cutter. Uh, this is a very different machine. It's a much lighter machine than a Tormach. So I'm going to change this to tool diameter, which means for my 8th inch end mill, it'll move down by 0.125 inch increments. So now you should, you should see that it'll do several cutting passes. as soon as it finishes calculating. Okay, so you can see now it's doing two levels of cutting, which is good. Okay, the final thing I want to do is change the, leave, the stock to leave. And I'm going to set the radial to be 5 thousandths of an inch, and I'll set the axial to be zero. So that way we'll cut all the way to the bottom. And just for safety, I'm also going to uh, check flat area detection. Click OK, and then that'll take a little while to calculate. Okay, and actually I noticed that the flat area detection is, I think, giving us these segments here. These don't really do anything, so I'm going to turn off flat area detection and see if that fixes that issue. No. Nope. So I'm not sure what these are all about. It's, it's basically doing a movement that's not really going to do much. Uh, anyway, I'll keep that the way it is. The final thing I want to do is a, a pass to get this about uh, to within the, the size that I want for the reamer. The hole right now is actually four thousandths under the, the actual size of quarter inch. Uh, and that way I can use about 2% of the, the reamer diameter of uh, material that needs to be removed. Uh, for one of these, I'm going to use an undersized reamer, and for the other, I'm going to use an oversized reamer. And that means that the dowel pin should stick to one side and move fairly easily through the other side. OK, so let me go ahead and add the, uh, for this, I'm going to do a 2D contour. And then I'm going to select, uh, make, yep, that's the correct tool. And for geometry, I'm going to select the bottom selection. And then for heights, I'll say selected contour, that's perfect. Go ahead and execute it. And that looks good. The other thing that I like to do is I like to rename these so that I remember what this is. So if you remember, this is a 964th inch drill. So I'll go ahead and change the name so that it says 964th drill. Actually, we have drill twice, don't really need that twice. So I'll just say 964th. Likewise, the adaptive is uh, using a uh, 1 8 inch end mill. So I'd like to mark that. And then this is also going to be 1 8 uh, end mill. And that way, when I'm uh, posting, uh, I, I remember what these are because I like to post them as uh, separate files so I can try one file at a time. So let's go ahead and post these. Oops, that's simulate. Actually, that's a good point. Let's simulate first. So we'll go ahead and simulate the whole, th all three steps. And uh, this one will just make sure that it's pecking, which it is. Okay, so that's good, which means now we can skip to the next operation which should be the adaptive mill. So let's take a look at this. Okay, that looks good. We'll just keep simulating. I'll speed it up a little bit. And then the last operation should be the 2D, or 2D contour finish pass. And there we have it. Okay, let me go ahead and post these. So I'll create, uh, I've already done it, I created a test folder 
And I like to name the files as well with the so that they have the the name of the tool that I'm going to use. So the first is drill 964. And then we have oops, wrong one. Then we have uh, second one is one eighth inch adaptive. And the final one is one eighth contour. And you'll notice that I also like to put numbers in front of them. I didn't for the drill, but this this reminds me of the order in which I want to to execute these. And one of the reasons I do it these way, this way is because I really do uh, one toolpath at a time. And I sometimes, well, quite often, go back to my computer and make adjustments in between the different uh, operations. So this allows me to work with single operations and not have to worry about uh, fast forwarding. Let's over to, head over to the machine and see what happens. Okay, enough trial and error. I mean, seriously, a lot of smart people have spent a lot of time thinking about it, and they've come up with equations and formulas and rules. So I'm not sure why I thought trial and error would work. I, after these tests, I went back and I watched uh, John Saunders' uh, videos on feeds and speeds, excellent videos, and I'm going to try to put a card up there for them. I then tried uh, his uh, spreadsheet, learned a lot from his spreadsheet, and then what I discovered is that feeds and speeds is pretty much built into Fusion 360. So you don't have to use a separate spreadsheet. What I'm going to show you next is what I learned and how you can use Fusion 360 for feeds and speeds. I'm going to use the zigzags principle or approach that John Saunders talked about. And what you're going to see is that there's only so much I can do with my tag because uh, since it's belt driven, I only have a small number of speeds that I can choose from. Anyway, let's head back to the computer. The first thing I discovered, well, not the first thing, but eventually I discovered that I had also made a mistake with my tools. If you take a look here, uh, for the end cutter, I have it set to three flutes. The reason it's that way is because I started with the samples and they have three flutes. Well, turns out my mills, uh, my end cutters do not have three flutes, they have two. After watching uh, the NYC CNC videos, I'm going to go out and buy some three flute cutters, but I don't have them at the moment. So what I want to do is go here to my project and change the tool so it's two flutes. Now that will require recalculating everything. And by the way, I also want to change it in the other places as well before I forget to make sure that it's two flutes in the different places. All right. You can see this is now invalid. That's because it reset everything. So I'm going to set this up again the way I had it. So I had it at 
seven tenths inches per tooth. And then the other thing is you notice that this went back to 8,000 feet per minute. Now the cool thing here is that there are two things I, I want to control. One is I want to set the feet per tooth. The other thing I have control over is the RPM. Now if I change the RPM, it will recalculate the cutting feed, which is exactly what I want. On my machine, I have, let's see, six different speeds, which is not a whole lot. So I was getting a lot of chatter, which means I want to reduce the RPM. That's what uh, John suggested, so I tried it. And I started with 2600 RPM, which if I'm typing in the right window, okay, I don't know why that wasn't working. Let's try that again, 2600. You'll notice it went down to 3.64 inches per minute. That's pretty slow, but we're also taking a deeper cut than I'm used to. The other thing we're going to want to do is uh, have the lead-in be uh, about the same. I'll make it a little bit more, so I'll make it 6 inches per minute. great. So time for the zigzag. Zigzag says, all right, the next thing you do is you cre increase the RPMs. Well, the next step I up, have up from 2600 is 4200. It's quite a jump. And I don't, oops, wrong one. And you can see the feed rate went up to 5.8. I tried that in the second video, and as you'll see, it worked fine. The surface finish actually looked pretty good, but I was hearing some chatter. <laughs> What I learned from this is that there's a limit to what I can do with my tag with the belt-driven system. I may increase the uh, load per tooth to about one thousandth, but other than that, I'm going to use the lower speed, and I think I have a recipe that's going to work. So, the next step is to start cutting the molds. See you next time.